All right. Well, welcome to my studio here in fabulous Las Vegas. Today's uh, lecture is on economics. This is a lecture that's appropriate for the SIE candidates, five or six questions for you on your exam. And uh, series 65 is five or six questions for you on your exam. So uh, pretty much the same stuff. I'll, I'll point out if there's any distinction between the two. You know, in college, this would be, you know, probably two semesters, micro and macro. And, you know, we're not interested in turning you into an economist on the exam. What we're you know, kind of interested in is you don't embarrass the firm at a cocktail party. I always kind of joke, if you want to sound like you know what you're talking about, and somebody asks you about economics or finance or investments, and you want to sound smart, you should say it has a lot to do with interest rates. And if you just shut up, you sound pretty good. So um, let's get started. Let's get started. Here's kind of a roadmap of what we'll be discussing in today's uh, lecture. You are held accountable on both exams for distinguish, distinguishing between monetary policy, which is the money supply, controlled by the Federal Reserve Board, also known as our central bank. There are other central banks in the world, but uh, our central bank is you know, the largest because of our economy and things like that. Uh, you're held accountable on the tools of the Fed. So we'll be talking about their various tools that they use in terms of trying to make sure that we don't have too much money or too little money floating around, too much currency or too little currency, US dollars. And uh, then we're gonna talk about fiscal policy, uh, government spending and taxation, that's testable to know it's controlled by Congress and the president. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the dem demand side economics uh, theory, you know, by Lord John Manny Keynes, theory isn't truth, just a way of explaining things. and. The more a theory can explain, the better that theory is. And then we'll talk about supply side economics. So kind of a roadmap for today's uh, lecture. Uh, Lord John Maynard Keynes said, there's no sub subtler, subtler, excuse me, I need another cup of coffee this morning. <laughs> no sure means of overturning the existing basis of society to debauch the currency. You know, he's from the United Kingdom, but you know, whether it's the Weimar Republic and Germany before uh, World War II, or uh, presently in uh, Venezuela. Uh, here, the currency is a US dollar we'll be discussing. The process engages all the forces of economic law on the side of destruction, and it doesn't matter which not one man in a million is able to diagnose. Too much money or too little money. So inflation, our first test question is, infl is about inflation. And uh, let's get a text box going here. Let's see, we got a good font size going. Let's see, I think that's a good font size. Let's get us a different color here. And so inflation is too much money chasing too few goods. And uh, that's not good. That's not good because we have too much money chasing too few goods. You know, uh, there's certain investments that aren't going to do so well. I mean, the two reasons, well, you know, what I used to say as a practitioner is, listen, what we're delaying gratification today and not spending our money for is so that later on, perhaps by investing, if we can overcome taxation and overcome purchasing power risk, we'll be able to buy more stuff in the future than we can buy now. I mean, if we can't, you know, overcome inflation, we'd be better off to just spend the money today, right? Because the whole idea here is that we're going to you know, delay gratification today, take those US dollars, turn them into investments, and at some future date, turn those investments back into dollars, and we're hoping we have more dollars, but even more importantly, more purchasing power. When you ask people why they invest, a lot of times they say, well, we'll make money, but so what if you have more money, but it buys you less products and services? Now, there's some investments that do better than others in an inflationary environment. You know, common stock tends to do much better than does you know, fixed income investment vehicles as an inflation hedge. Now I joke, if you get into a, McDonald's, a time machine and you put it for 20 years forward and you get out and you walk into a McDonald's and you order the value meal, you know, they laugh at you when you hand them 10 bucks and it doesn't cover it. You know, I can remember vividly 20 years previous, right? You get into a McDonald's, you get the value meal for two, $3. So as you notice, the menu board at uh, McDonald's is very easily uh, changed. And so we would expect that corporation, in this case, McDonald's, to pass through any inflation experiences to its consumers. And we would expect that to be reflected at some point in the stock price. So if I get out 20 years in my time machine and I go into McDonald's, I'm kind of a little uh, shocked by the pricing. I call my broker. He says, Dean, where you been? I said, it's a long story, but sell 100 shares of uh, McDonald's and send me a check. 
Now, hopefully the Golden Arches is still around. So, you know, maybe I should have diversified uh, before uh, I've got in that time machine. Now, something that doesn't do so well in an inflationary environment, and again, this is uh, testable in terms of suitability, are fixed income investment vehicles. Those don't tend to hold up well in an inflationary environment. And by way of review, some of those fixed invest, uh, fixed income investment vehicles would be like bonds, right? Particularly longer term bonds would be do even worse, right? So those are two that would not do so well. Uh, deflation, deflation, that's not good either. Uh, deflation is too many goods and not enough money. You know, this is uh, kind of bad because if there's uh, deflation, too many goods and not enough money, what will happen is uh, people who have money will sit on it, right? I mean, why would I spend my money today if in the future it's going to buy me more than it buys today? My, my money becomes more valuable. Now, uh, fixed in investment vehicles do pretty well. They do pretty well in this kind of an environment. Now, the point here is that uh, too much money is a bad thing, too little money is a bad thing. And so we wanna make sure we have just the right amount of money. And the person who's in charge of making sure that we have the right amount of US dollars floating around, not too much money chasing too few goods because if there's more demand than supply of money, prices go up or too many goods and not enough money because if that's the case, uh, prices come down is uh, the Federal Reserve Board. That's kind of where we're heading, right? To make sure that uh, you know they are managing this for price stability or price equilibrium but ultimately fixed income investment vehicles in this environment uh, do well. Now, we're not gonna on the task ask you to recognize that the CPI, the consumer price index, is the price of a basket, and goods, a basket of goods and services in a particular city, no. What we are gonna ask you to recognize on your exam is that it's a measurement of inflation. And we're gonna ask you on your exam to uh, recognize constant dollars, constant dollars are dollars that are adjusted for inflation. And we're gonna adjust either returns or the dollars themselves or, uh, or GDP, for example, adjusted for inflation. I think the best example I can recall of this was an all family episode that was a sitcom and the college educated uh, son-in-law, Archie came home from the factory where he worked and he told his uh, college educated son-in-law meathead that he got a 5% pay raise. And Meathead said, well, our CPI went up 10. You know, test question, what is Meathead trying to tell Arch? What he's trying to tell him is he got a 5% pay raise, but the consumer price index rose 10%. In inflation, constant dollars, he actually took a 5% pay cut. And that'll be very much how that gets asked on your exam. We'll even give you a turn or GDP, give you the CPI rate and you just uh, net the two numbers. Right, your client's portfolio had a 5% return. The consumer price index was 5%. What was your return in constant dollars? And you would say on your exam, uh, zero, zero. Well, as we mentioned, too much money, uh, too little money is a, a bad thing. And so we wanna make sure that we have just the right amount of money, not too much, not too little. And the person who's in charge of that, oh, before we get going on the Federal Reserve Board, I like to pull a couple questions here. I pulled this question from the FINRA SIE practice exam version four. I think that's what that means on their site. V4 means version four, I think. Uh, anyways, uh, I pulled this question. I think that FINRA practice exam is uh, very good for the SIE candidates. And as I said, the 65, very similar kind of questions. So I uh, pulled that uh, from there here. And I always like to explicate, go over questions and write answers and, and talk about them. Uh, I highly recommend you do that exam. If you go to the uh, web, the YouTube channel, I've explicated that entire exam. So I went through the all the 75 questions and talked about why the right answers are right, why the wrong answers are wrong, and what the wrong answers within the right answers to. And you know, I highly recommend that to you to check that out. Uh, if you want to use it as a practice exam, you can just hit the pause button. You know, try it on your own until I answer it. But anyway, here's the one I pulled. The owner of which of the following is most exposed? to inflationary risk. And let's see, uh, we got the uh, T bills. Well, not, you know, you should have been able to make A and D pretty quickly because we just said, test point, common stocks do better. You know, common stocks are good inflation edge. So I should have been able to eliminate A and choice D and that gives me a 
Now I got to decide between treasury bills. Now treasury bills, you know, three, six, you know, 12 months, I'm just going into whatever today's rate is. And so I'm not going to be greatly exposed there to interest rate risk because I'll just can be rolling into whatever today's interest rates are, which means a treasury bond test question would be the right answer here. See, as we said, very important to know in terms of suitability, you know, what would do well or what would not do, do so well. We said common stocks. Now, blue chip and poker is the most expensive chip in the poker game. And a blue chip in stocks, when I say it's a blue chip stock, that means it has a proven track record in good times and bad. And so, boy, a blue chip industrials, you know, we want to make sure this is a company that in good times and bad inflationary environments or deflationary environments, they've been able to manage that business, right? So that's what a blue chip is. Uh, by the way, if I flip this question and I said the owner of which of the following would be most exposed, least exposed, if I said least exposed, the answer there would be D. Now, because utility stocks borrow a bunch of money. And so, you know, they might have to, you know, that might play out not so well for them. All right, so the Federal Reserve Board. Uh, the Federal Reserve Board, as we said, is in charge of monetary policy, the money supply. We said we want to make sure there's not too much money floating around, too little money floating around. In this case, we're talking about U.S. dollars, right? The People's Bank of China is in ch charge of making sure there's not too much U.N. or too little U.N. flowing around. That's their currency. Uh, we said that their mandate is price stability or price equilibrium. Not too much, not too little. And we're going to talk about the tools they have in terms of interest rates to control that money supply. They have a second mandate called full employment. Now, a lot of people miss that and they don't really get into that second mandate on your exams. But right now, Jerome Powell, who's our chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, has said he's more interested in the second mandate right now, promoting full employment than he is in his first mandate or that co-equal mandate of price stability. He says, I don't see any inflationary pressure pressures presently and so I don't see any reason we would be doing anything to, you know, constrict or restrict the money supply. In fact, you know, we're letting loose. So, uh, but they do have that dual mandate. One tool the Fed has is the Fed tells uh, banks how much they have to keep on reserve to meet their everyday demand for uh, banking. You know, I kind of know that my uh, bank is using my money, but I don't expect that when I put my ATM into the machine and hit $300, that the thing doesn't spit out any money, it says busy with your money. <laughs> I expect there's a certain amount of money available to bank. You know, the best uh, movie on banking I've ever seen, and I highly recommend it, It's a Wonderful Life. It's a Wonderful Life shows every Christmas, and Jim, Jamie, St Jimmy Stewart is the guy who owns the, uh, runs the credit union, and he has his reserve requirement, the money he needs each day to meet the everyday demand for banking. And he goes to see Mr. Potter, who's the competing bank in the town, and he accidentally forgets the reserve requirement with Mr. Potter, Potter. And Mr. Potter, if he has that reserve requirement and the credit union can't open, he's going to have a monopoly on money in that local community. And there's more, no more insidious kind of a monopoly than that on money. Anyways, there's a run on the credit union and he has to, you know, in about five minutes or less than that, I don't know what the running time in the movie is, he has to explain reserve banking to those people to get them not to, you know, take out their money. <laughs> I was in Moscow one time and uh, the Moscow banker, the people were lined up outside. There was a run on this guy's bank and the, the Russian said, I'm busy with your money, so we're not open for withdrawals today. But if you're here to make a deposit, please be, remain patient and we will be opening shortly and wait till you see what we're paying overnight. <laughs> I said, oh my goodness. Well, the idea here is that one deposit, one deposit, let me get a little bigger font here, is gonna create a lot of money. This is called the multiplier effect of money, not testable. But let's say I get a $10,000 uh, loan and I put that into a bank and that bank is gonna to have to keep, if the reserve requirement, I'll just make up a reserve requirement. Let's put that down here. Uh, let's say the reserve requirement is 10%. And so that means that this bank is gonna to have to keep $1,000 and can loan out $9,000. And the person who gets that loan is going to take that to a bank and put it in there. And that bank is gonna to have to keep 900 and can loan out 8,100. Oh, let me get my And that bank has to keep 810. And so as you can see here, this one deposit creates a whole lot of money. Let's see if my, uh, my annotation tool is working this morning. Sometimes it's uh, been on the fritz. Hey, good news. So there we go. There we go. There we go. All right. So that one deposit creates a whole lot of money in terms of uh, banking. 
Now, if the Fed, if the Fed thinks things are not fast and loose enough, one thing the Fed can do, let's get a different color here, is the Fed can lower the reserve requirement. And by lowering the reserve requirement, banks have more money that they can loan out. And so if the banks have more money to loan out, if they lower the reserve requirement, the money supply, the amount of money available will increase. And since there's more money available, you shouldn't have to pay as much for it, much rent, more interest rates, and so interest rates should fall. So, so if they lower the uh, this number down to from 10 to percent, for example, to 5%, that frees up money, right? Uh, now, on the other hand, if uh, the Fed thinks things are too fast and loose, uh, the Fed can raise the reserve requirement. And by raising the reserve requirement, banks have less money to lend out. The money supply goes down, and that means if there's less money, you might have to pay more to borrow that. So if they raise the reserve requirement, the money supply contracts. Uh, let me just get my... and interest rates should go up. You know, one of the Fed chairmen said that the job of the Fed is to take the punch bowl away from the party just as the party gets rolling. Now, if the punch bowl is spiked, that might not be a bad idea, right? And so, you know, that's one of the tools they have. Now you have to meet this reserve requirement every night. So every night you have to meet the reserve requirement. Now there's some banks who have excess reserves. They haven't made as many loans as other banks. And there's some banks with deficient reser reserves. And so one uh, interest rate you're held accountable for is the Fed funds rate. And Fed funds rate is banks with excess reserves lending the banks with deficient reserves. I don't know, is there two Fs in that? I don't know. Oh, well, there's some reserves. Now, of all the interest rates you're held accountable for, of all the uh, what rates you're held accountable for, the Fed funds is the most volatile. It changes the most often. Now that one is not set by the Fed. That one is not set by the Fed. You know, that's one that's targeted by the Fed, but not set by the Fed. Now, if you can't get this money from a fellow bank, if you can't get this money from a fellow bank, you can go to get it directly from the Fed. And if you get this directly from the Fed, that test question is called the discount rate. Now, the problem with borrowing this from the Fed is the Fed might ask you, well, gee, how come you need this money? How come you can't get this money from a fellow bank. Now the discount rate, on all these rates, by the way, you gotta know where the money's coming from and where the money's going to. This is money that's coming from the Federal Reserve to member banks. So the discount rate is from Fed to bank. This is set by the Fed. This is the one they actually set directly. Uh, that's set by the Fed. Uh, by the way, if you uh, borrow this money from the Fed, you know, I think a good analogy is my my brother and his kids when they were growing up, you know, well, uh, Brian is a spender and, uh, you know, Aaron is a saver. And so sometimes uh, Brian would like to buy things. He doesn't have the money. So he goes to his uh, brother and says, can I borrow some money? And there's no questions asked. He just gives it to him. You know, Chris came home one time and there was a motorcycle out front and he said, how in the world did you get enough money for a motorcycle? And uh, Aaron said he borrowed it from his brother. You know, Chris had to implement his own reserve requirement and say, listen to uh, the uh, Aaron, the saver, listen, you can't lend out more than, you know, 30% of your piggy bank without coming to me. So you can kind of keep a control of what's going on. So sometimes we refer to the discount rate as the penalty rate, right? You know, and if you go borrow the money from dad, you know, there's gonna be a lot more questions asked than if you just get it from your brother, right? Anyways, that's set by the Fed. Sometimes we call that the penalty rate. So you're held accountable for uh, four interest rates, and these are two of them. And so make sure you definitely have that on both your exams. You know what these two rates are, flashcard kind of stuff, recognition. Now, when you borrow money from the Fed, when you borrow money from the Fed, they're going to want collateral. 
They're going to say, what kind of collateral do you have? And so, you know, what you're going to have to pledge is your securities. And a repo is where you're pledging securities overnight for a loan. And this guy, treasury securities. And there are others, but for test purposes, these are treasury bonds. Right now, the Fed is operating under exigent circumstances, meaning it can accept a lot of other things that it doesn't usually. But you're pledging U.S. securities, uh, treasury bonds overnight for a loan. And so what you're going to do is you're going to say to the Fed, uh, I'd like to borrow some money overnight here. My treasury bonds, you're agreeing as a bank that tomorrow you'll you know, unwind that. You'll buy back the bonds at a little higher price overnight. So this is high quality debt maturing overnight. And remember, we call high quality debt maturing overnight. We call those, well, within less than a year, uh, money market securities. So repos are used elsewhere, but they're also used here. And I would know that a repo is a money market security. Okay, let's see. Uh, got a lot of stuff going on in this slide. Looks like we've uh, talked about what we need to in terms of the reserve requirement. Now, this is not the tool the Fed uses most often. This is not the tool the Fed uses most often. The tool the Fed uses the most often is open market operations, open market operations. And so let's talk about that. So uh, the Fed right now has been buying up to $130 billion of government securities each month. Wow. And when the Fed buys government securities, you know, usually U.S. Treasury again, bonds, but let's just say gubbies. If you want to sound like a player, you'd say gubbies. That means U.S. Treasury securities, typically Treasury bonds. You know, at the start of the financial crisis, you know, in 2008, 2009, the Federal Reserve Board's balance sheet was $500 billion. You know, last time I checked, it's up uh, past $4 trillion. And so that means the Fed is about another $3.5 trillion worth of government securities. So think about it. When the Fed buys government securities, the securities come into the central bank and the money goes out. And so when they buy government securities, buys gubbies, the money supply rises. There's more money available. Goes up or goes up. Again, if there's more money available, then that means interest rates should go down. You know, at some point they're gonna to have to reverse course. You know, as I said, uh, you know, at some point they're gonna reverse course and when they reverse course, they're gonna start selling government securities. And when they sell government securities, Yeah, usually treasury bonds again, but you know, the money supply. Now think about it. When we sell the government securities on the open market committee, the Fed, the securities are going out and the, you know, money is coming in. So the money supply is going to contract or go down. You know, right now the Fed is practicing what we call easy money, but at some point they're probably going to tighten up, particularly if they're, you know, inflationary pressure builds. You know, in fact, right now there's a debate about is, you know, inflation something to be worried about or not. Again, I've told you both, I've had the honor and privilege to I meet mean, Janet Yellen, our, form, our former chairman of the Fed and now uh, US Secretary of Treasury on her ladder of offices up. She used to be the, uh, uh, the president of the San Francisco Federal Reserve District Bank. And when I had her national visitors, I would take them down there for a field trip. But anyways, um, she's now Treasury Secretary in charge of fiscal policy. And well, not in charge, but involved. And we'll clean that up in a little bit. But anyways, uh, both her and Jerome Powell, chairman of the Fed, are saying that we're not worried about inflationary pressures. We're worried about other things. And, uh, you know, we'll see how it plays out. Anyways, when we sell government securities, the money supply contracts, goes down. And if again, if there's less money available, that means if the money supply contracts or declines and there's less money available, then interest rates should go up. Yeah, let's go that up. Uh, by the way, this also affects uh, international balance of trade things, right? Because, you know, if the dollar is strong, you know, or weak, that has something to do with interest rates. Usually a higher interest rate on treasury securities makes the dollar more attractive. And that means, you know, uh, that could have an impact on it. When the dollar is weak and interest rates are low, the dollar is least attractive economically as compared to other currencies, whether it be the euro or the yen or, you know, the yuan 
or you know whatever it happens to be. So that also uh, has an impact there as well. Uh, this is the one they do most often. And I would know that as a test issue. That's the tool they most often use at the Fed to do accomplish the things we're talking about. Uh, here's another good uh, example of this. I pulled this from uh, I pulled this uh, from the FINRA practice exam. U65 is very similar question, right? So a period of low inflation, that's where we're at right now. Economic recession, we had two calendar quarters of giant declining GDP. It looks like we're back up again, but the Fed is expected to take which of the following actions. In fact, this is what it's doing. Now you should have been able to eliminate rather quickly, maybe not right now, but by the end of this lecture, you certainly should be able to. You should have been able to eliminate that because at the end of this lecture, you're gonna know that's fiscal policy. So you should have been able to eliminate, eliminate that one right off the bat. Uh, raise the Fed funds rate. You should have been able to eliminate that because you should know that the Fed does not set the Fed funds rate. They target it, but they don't set it. You know, it's banked with excess reserves, linked to banks with deficient reserves. What they set, remember, is the discount rate, not the Fed funds. Uh, let's see. So now you got to decide what, what they're going to be concerned with. You know, if they're worried about inflation, too much money chasing too few goods or an overheating economy, well, then they would increase reserves. But it says here, it's a period of low inflation and there is recession, so they're going to buy government securities in the open market. And remember the effect that will have, let's just go ahead and put that in here. When they do that, remember the money supply is going to go up. And interest rates should go down. And low interest rates in theory and practice should, uh, you know, make the, uh, refloat the economy or get business fired up if, the cost of money is cheap, or as Lord John Maynard Keynes said, maybe we can reignite those animal spirits. I like that question. Uh, here's one that I came up with because this answer set is very, very important on your exam. You're held accountable to know four interest rates. And we talked about two of these already, so let's get out our text thing here. This is flashcard stuff, and boy, you don't wanna give up flashcard stuff on your exam. You know, the three styles of questions are recognition. Here's a recognition question. Practical application, you know, break-evens, current yield, calculating parity, tax-free, taxable equivalent yields. You don't give up those. You want to save your misses for judgments. We said the discount rate, remember, is set directly by the Fed. So, you know, it could have been one of these answers. We don't know what, what the question is. We just know what this answer said is. They would have said, which of the following is set directly by the Fed? The discount rate, right? If they would have said, which of these is uh, Fed, money coming from the Fed to member banks, that too would be the discount rate. Now, on the other hand, if they said on your exam, which of these is the most volatile, changes the most often? Now, if they would have said on your exam, which of the following is banks with excess reserves? Lending to banks with deficient reserves. Then you would have said Fed funds. So depending on what the question is, depends on what the answer is, right? Uh, we haven't talked about this one, but very testable. In other lectures we have, and uh, you should definitely know that broker call is what banks, that's banks to broker terms. Now, don't go overkill on this. Drives me nuts. Like all the providers go totally overboard on this idea of rehypothecation customer securities in margin accounts to banks. Have you ever joined me for a Series 24 General Securities Principle class? Well, then it becomes a huge issue or a 27 Financial and Operations Principle. But you know, you don't really have to know too much about rehypothecation. But you know what happens is the customer pledges his securities to the broker dealer as collateral for the margin loan. And then we rehypothecate it to a banker and Mr. Banker gives us the money at broker call. We typically lend it to customers at broker call plus. So banks, brokerage firms. And I would know that this is used to finance uh, debit balances and margin accounts, what you owe the brokerage firm. And remember debit balances, borrowing from the brokerage firm can be a very competitive loan. You know, Larry Ellison loves using his margin account. And they bought the island of Lanai and he pledged his securities as collateral to get the $500 million. 
Yeah, when he joined the board of Tesla, he borrowed a billion dollars to buy some Tesla stock to show his uh, personal skin in the game, so to speak, and he used his margin account. So this is used to finance debit balances and uh, margin accounts. And again, those margin, those loans to our customer can be very, very competitive compared to other places to borrow money, right? Right now, the collective debit balances at brokerage firms is $600 billion. So uh, prime rate is banks to its best customer, money center banks like JP Morgan lending to Microsoft. You know, I joke, that's what you need to pay to borrow money if you don't need to borrow any money, right? So prime rate is banks to its best customers. You know, major money center banks like Bank of America, uh, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, Citibank do its best customers like Microsoft or Amazon or, or uh, you know, uh, Google. All right. So as I mentioned, the, you know, the currency, the exchange rate can have uh, an impact on the balance of trade. You know, if the U.S. dollar weakens, by the way, it's, it's, it's meaningless to say the dollar is weakening, weakening or strengthening unless I have the other currency in there. But ultimately, when the U.S. dollar is uh, weakening, weakens, the test question is what effect does it have on the balance of trade? And it makes U.S. exports more competitive and U.S. imports less competitive. Now, I warn you, if you have any kind of a international perspective, you are at risk on the exam. So this exam assumes the whole, the center of the uni financial universe is New York City and everything moves around New York City. Now, I'm gonna show you an example of this in just a moment, right? But even though the yen goes up against the dollar and it takes less yen to get dollars, Boeing can lower the price of the airplanes making the uh, price more attractive. And if Toyota, if the uh, dollar weakens and Toyota is selling a car here in the US, that means they got to get more dollars to get the same number of yen coming back. And it means they got to raise their prices if they want to have the same number of yen, making the Toyotas made in Japan uh, less competitive. And the other test question would be the other way. I'm going to show you both of these in just a sec. But when the US uh, dollar strengthens, that makes US exports less competitive because that means we need to get more euros or yen or whatever the case may be to get the same number of dollars coming back less competitive and u.s imports uh, more competitive you know uh, for right now for example the dollar has strengthened substantially against the peso. Last time I checked, it was 20 pesos to get a buck. It not so long ago was 10 pesos to get a buck. You know, that means that, you know, what used to be a $50 bottle of tequila is now a $25 bottle of tequila. The tequila is actually uh, more competitive. You know, I joked that when the dollar weakened against the British pound, you now my bartender was a joke, but I, I, one of my favorite single malt scotches is Lagavulin. It's made in the Isla in Scotland. And I had ordered a maker's mark instead. He said, hey, Dean, what's up? You didn't order your leg of Ulan. I said, have you seen the British pound to the US dollar? It's nearly doubled. You know, my bottle of scotch that used to cost me, you know, 50 bucks is now costing me a hundred bucks. And at a hundred bucks, I think I'll drink a traditional American whiskey. I'll be doing my patriotic duty and helping the balance of trade. So again, that can affect it. Let me give you an example of that in the next slide. So here's Boeing, here's Boeing, and Boeing is selling its planes in Japan. And uh, let's say right now the uh, exchange rate is 100 to one. That's pretty cool, close to the spot rate, 100 yen to get a dollar. And so, you know, Boeing is gonna sell the airplane. That's an airplane. And uh, Japan is going to give us the yen and they're going to send the yen. It's going to come out this way, right? And that's what they need to pay all their workers in Seattle. Now, if the dollar weakens against the yen, if the dollar weakens against the yen, and now it only takes 
eighty dollars or eighty yen to get a buck, you know, Boeing can lower the price of the airplanes and get the same number of yen coming back. Right now, on the other hand, here Toyota remembers they're selling Toyotas. We're assuming that's a Toyota made in uh, Japan, and now if they want to get that same number of yen coming back, they were getting a hundred, but now they're only getting eighty. And so what uh, Toyota was going to have to do, if they choose to, they might decide just to eat the loss. But, you know, if they want to get that same number of yen, they're going to have to raise their prices, causing the, you know, Toyotas to be less competitive compared to a Ford or a GM. You know, now I'm oversimplifying that, but that's my job. That's one of the reasons, by the way, that Japanese automobile manufacturers have built some factories here in the U.S. is, you know, they can switch, you know, manufacturing based on the currency. <laughs> I like to smoke a Cuban cigar every now and again. And, you know, uh, you're allowed personal use. It's not considered a violation of doing business with a foreign energy act if you don't go over a certain dollar amount. Long story short, but you can't buy them domestically. And so, uh, you know, I buy them in Australia. I have guys I work with in Europe and Australia. And anyways, I have my guy in Australia, you know, Bear Nose is the cigar guy. He says, Dean, you shouldn't buy them from me because the exchange rate right, right now makes them more competitive to buy them from your guy in the UK. I like that they, by the way, don't take advantage of the foreign currency, right? The guy that you came at, say, hey, Dean, it's Australia. And I was in Thailand and there was a, uh, the guy wanted to play, speculate on exchange rates with me. I was buying a blue sapphire and, and I, he said, what do you want to do on the exchange rate? And I said, well, if you want to let it ride, I'm fine. I mean, I'll settle up with you right now. We can set the rate or we can let it float, whatever you want to do. And I felt bad for him. He, his decision, he thought he knew a lot of exchange rate, I guess. And by the time I actually got that on my credit card and settled up, I got it at like a 30% discount. I, I felt bad. I called him and said, hey, listen, I don't, didn't mean to take advantage of you. That was your, your choice to let that thing float and moved against you. Anyways, uh, let's look at the different direction now here. So let's say now the dollar strengthens and uh, now it takes 120 yen to get a dollar. So now Boeing, if they want to get the same number of dollars coming back, is going to have to raise the price of the airplanes to get the same number of uh, dollars coming back. And that makes the Airbuses a little more competitive, right? And then, uh, Arg is not my thing. Let's say that's a Toyota pickup. You know, Toyota now only needs a dollar, we'll get them 120 yen, so they can uh, go ahead if they choose to, and they can lower their prices causing that to become more competitive. So that's an illustration of that. All right, here's a good example of a, a test question that I pulled from FINRA. You know, I kind of hinted at this idea of exchange rates and there's forward rates and, you know, we can use futures and all kinds of stuff. But when selling a fixed amount of a base currency to purchase a counter currency, which of the following factors is used to determine how much of the counter currency the customer will receive? So I can't wait till the pandemic's over because you know I have a place in Ensenada. I usually spend a night or two in San Diego and I cross the border. Now, assuming before I cross the border, I'm gonna turn dollars into pesos. I'm probably not, but let's assume I was. You know, what I'm interested in again is that spot rate. Whoop. That is very much, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, a, a test question. I uh, pulled that uh, from the FINRA exam. Now, remember that spot rate is su supply and demand market relationships. Now, most currencies are what we call floating currencies. They float based on supply and demand and competitive pressure. And so these other things are built into that. You know, there are some currencies that don't float. For example, you know, North Korean currency doesn't, can't be exchanged for anything, right? But uh, the counter currency inflation rate is built into the spot rate, right? The trade balance between the two countries is built into that spot rate as well. And the credit quality of the counter currency's government is built into that credit uh, to that spot rate as well. So B, C, and D are actually part of what's reflected in that exchange rate, right? You know, in Mexico, we right now have a guy named uh, AMLO. Well, that's his initials, Antonio Manuel Lopez Obrador. Don't hold me accountable on, but I think that's what AMLO stands for. And, uh, you know, part of why the peso has been weakening against the U.S. dollars is he makes a lot of people nervous about, you know, holding their pesos, right? So uh, people are a little more comfortable with the dollar. So that's all reflected in that, that exchange rate. All right, so here we have debits and credits to the balance of trade. The current account is kind of like an indiv uh, individual has a checking account. 
you know, and you have money out and you have money in and you're a checking account. Uh, countries also have a checking account called a current account. You know, debits is U.S. dollars going out, debits to the balance of trade. So, you know, I told you I'm kind of a geek, but Americans purchased $300 million worth of tequila last year. So we're going to give our Mexican friends the U.S. dollars. They're going to give us $300 million worth of tequila. So that's U.S. dollars out. And so if we have more U.S. dollars leaving than foreign currency coming in, you know, our Mexican friends uh, spent uh, billions of dollars buying U.S. products. Right. So we're going to net those two numbers. If the debit exceeds the credit, uh, we have a trade deficit. You know, now, another way we might say that is if, you know, our exports, our uh, imports are more than our exports, that's another way to express that, we're going to have a deficit. So credits are money in. You know, I gave you Boeing selling its planes to Japan. So Boeing gives them the planes, we give, they give us the Japanese yen. And so that's a foreign currency coming in. If we have more credits than debits, we have a trade surplus. Now, another way to express that is we have more exports, net exports than net imports. But that balance of trade, again, is uh, testable. The thing that's testable here is this idea, you know, just uh, so you know what's the testable point, is this idea of what is a debit or credit and how does that reflect on the balance of trade? Okay, well, fiscal policy. We said you're held accountable for monetary policy and fiscal policy. And uh, fiscal policy, let's put that in here, fiscal policy. Let's get us a big, we got plenty of space here. So let's get us a nice big font. Fiscal policy test question is government spending and taxation. And test question, uh, fiscal policy is controlled by Congress and the president. That too is testable. So you remember we said you could test on monetary policy is the money supply controlled by test question the Federal Reserve Board. Uh, fiscal policy is government spending and taxation, and that is controlled by Congress and the president. You know, right now there's a debate about fiscal policy. You know, fiscal policy, the Save America Rescue Plan that President Biden has proposed is using fiscal policy, a trillion nine, one trillion nine hundred million dollars in government spending. You know, what he's hoping is that will have a, a salutary effect on the uh, economy, you know, that this will be a lot of money. Uh, Lauren Summers, who's a legendary secretary of treasury and uh, professor of economics of Harvard, kind of poured some cold water on that idea and said, well, I think that's too much and that might stimulate inflation. And, you know, Janet Yellen, who used to be the chairman of the Fed and Jerome Powell, currencies of fiscal and monetary policy are saying, we think the uh, danger is not doing enough rather than doing too much. So if we're going to overshoot this thing. They said, we think that's a better thing to pro probably do. But anyways, uh, back to our friend, Lord John Maynard Keynes. Our friend, uh, Lord John Maynard Keynes said, in the long run, we're all dead. You know, I told you one of his uh, famous books, his kind of first claim to fame was uh, Economic Consequences of the Peace that he wrote after World War I. He was part of the, the uh, negotiating of the Treaty of Versailles. And he said, listen, if, if you charge the Germans reparations they can't pay, don't be surprised if they don't, uh, you know, not only don't pay the reparations, they, they may be back. But more for us, he also published a legendary uh, Tome treatise called The General Theory of Employment, Interest Rates, and Money. And what Mr. Kane said is that when the economy is weak, the business cycle, we'll talk about the business cycle in a little bit, it's because there's no demand, because people who have resources won't spend them, and uh, people who don't have the resources can't spend it even if they didn't want to. And so what Mr. Uh, Kane said, is what the government should do is stimulate demand. So, you know, demand side economics. Uh, P.S. Sometimes we refer to this as a uh, theory by Keynes, right? Keynesian theory and there isn't truth is a way of explaining things. And demand side economics says that government spending can stimulate demand 
and it uh, has a positive. So government spending and taxation has a positive influence on the business cycle. We'll talk about the business cycle a little bit. So, you know, Mr. Keynes would be proud with the Save America Rescue Plan, right? I mean, you know, that would be something that he would, well, I don't know if he would, but I, I would assume he would, would. You know, well, prior to uh, Mr. Keynes, people said, you know, it'll all play out one way or another. It's just the nature of things. Things are cyclical and, you know, it'll figure it out, boom and bust. And he said, well, I think we should intervene. We're in the long run, we're dead. We should intervene here. So you step on the accelerator called government spending. And then once you get the economy going again, then you step on the brake called uh, government taxation. Now, every thesis has an uh, antithesis. And so the antithesis to demand side economics. Now, by the way, that would be the test question, by the way, is just recognize this, you know, the aim and shoot point and click. Nobody expects you to be an economist. They'll say uh, a theory of economics or what type of economics is it that sees government spending as a stimulant uh, to uh, in the business cycle or has a positive influence on the business cycle and you come up demand side economics. Now, supply to side economics kind of says the opposite, right? You know, in fact, that's what people are saying right now. The debate is, you know, is the government a good decision maker about allocation of resources or are individual consumers better decision makers about allocation of resources? And what supply said, side says is that government spending and taxation fiscal policy has a negative influence on the economy. And that being the case, that being the case, what the government should do is lower taxes, leave more money with the consumers who are better decision makers about what to do with that and uh, lower the regulatory burden of the government so that those consumers have uh, more resources, more incentive, basically leave the supply with the individual consumer. So we have demand side economics founded by Lord John Mayer Keynes and we have supply side economics. I, I, I'm, by the way, I'm totally oversimplifying this stuff, but that's what you need to pass the SIE in the series 65. Uh, gross domestic product is very testable. Again, this is just aim and shoot, point and click. As I mentioned, they might ask you to adjust this for constant dollars. And let me get a nice big font here. That's a big one. Uh, the gross domestic product is the total goods and services an economy produces. Total goods and services an economy produces. Uh, U.S. is number one in the world. No economy produces more products and services than the U.S. economy. You know, uh, China is number two. Uh, Japan is number three. Germany is number four. You're not going to have to rank it, but those are the economies, right? Gross domestic product. Now remember that we might ask you to adjust this uh, for uh, CPI in terms of constant dollars. Now, the reason this is important is because we use gross domestic product to try and figure out where we're at in the business cycle where we're at in the business cycle. Uh, here's Mr. Buffett. You know, what Mr. Buffett does or practices is top-down analysis. He makes a decision about the economy, which we're talking about now, and where the economy is in terms of the business cycle. Once Mr. Buffett makes that decision, then he decides what industry he should participate in, and then he uh, picks the company. For example, one of his uh, acquisitions was Burlington Northern, a railroad company. And so, you know, he looked at the economy, said, I think the U.S. economy is going to be uh, doing fine. I think that uh, uh, people are going to uh, be shipping products uh, products across the country. They're going to use a transportation company like Burlington to do so. I need to buy a railroad. Now, the way Mr. Buffett says it is he simply attempts to be fearful when others are greedy and to be greedy when others are fearful. So, you know, uh, this is kind of scary to me personally and attestable that in 2008, 2009, Mr. Buffett stepped up and started buying all kinds, tens of billions of dollars worth of stock. You know, and he said, I like to buy into fear and sell into greed. Uh, he didn't do that as much <laughs> at the onset of the pandemic. We said, oh, what, what happened to Mr. Buffett? He said, was to buy into fear and sell into greed. Where's he at? <laughs> you know, so, 
uh, leading economic indicators. Again, we want to know where we're at in the business cycle, but most importantly, where we're heading, right? So if I'm in a train and I want to know where I'm heading, I look at the locomotive, right? And then if I want to see where I'm at, coincident indicators, I look out the window. And if I want to see where I've been, I look at the caboose. Very testable stock prices, very testable. The stock market is all about earnings or future expectations of earnings. And so when they say, you know, uh, the stock market reacted favorably today. Now they might not just give you the stock market, stock prices, they might say like the S&P 500, they might say something like that. But you should definitely know that that is a uh, leading economic indicator. A negative yield curve, a negative yield curve. You know, a negative yield curve has been a pretty good one over the last, uh, you know, 50 years. Every time the yield curve has been inverted, we've been into a major recession within the next uh, 16 to 18 months. And a negative yield curve is when short term rates are higher than long term rates. You know, usually short term rates are lower than long term rates. And you know, what happens here, what happens here is, you know, when people get nervous about the economy, they start buying long-term bonds, causing the price to go down and the yield to go up, right? And they uh, want to buy, uh, stay, uh, you know, not doing anything short-term. Another way to think about this is when the Fed is, thinks the economy is too fast and loose, they start raising short-term rates, which they have more control over. And so that can accidentally, instead of bringing the economy in for the mythical soft landing, they accidentally, you know, kill the damn thing. So anyways, uh, Two test questions here. Do you recognize what a negative yield curve is? It's when short-term rates are higher than long-term rates. Second test issue, it's a negative leading economic indicator. It's bad for the economy. The credit spread. The credit spread is the difference between what high credit quality bonds pay and low credit quality bonds pay. Let's get us a different color here. You know, the guy who works the uh, junk bond desk at uh, Goldman Sachs in the last quarter of 2016 made $400 million, you know, buying bonds into a Goldman's inventory at the bid, selling them out at the offer. When they were asking about how he did that, he said there was no shenanigans involved. He said what happened was when President Trump was elected in the first part of the fourth quarter, a lot of people got really, really nervous. They started dumping their junk bonds. And I was the buyer, you know, when they were dump, jumping, I don't know how big my video screen is, or if you can see me here, but when they start jump, uh, dumping the junk bonds, the price goes down, the yields go up. And then what they do with the money is they buy high credit quality bonds, causing the price to go up and the yield to go down. And so if the yield gap is widening, which it was in the first part of that quarter, uh, that's negative. I might have overdone it on the size of my font here. <laughs> uh, let me change that. Let me give him a smaller font, change the color. Let's change the, I'm a little bit too much there. <laughs> right, and he said, then what happened is people said, well, maybe it's not gonna be so bad after all. And so then he said, okay, pay attention again. So I don't know if you can see me in the video screen. So towards the end of the fourth quarter, people said, well, maybe it's not so bad. So they started buying the junk bonds causing the price to go up and the yield to come down and selling their high credit quality bonds, causing the price to go uh, down and the yield to go up and it narrowed. And so when it's narrowing, that's a positive. And so he said, I was the seller. So, 
You know, he said at the beginning when the yield curve was widening and people were dumping their junk bonds, their low credit quality bonds, I was buying. And when they were buying, I was selling. So that's kind of what, uh, you know, bond desk does, right? Coincident indicators tell us where we're at. GDP is a coincident indicator. You can get a lot of these right by just, you know, what I told you before. I wouldn't overdose here, but, you know, again, if I'm traveling and I get lost, it's probably a good idea to pull over to the side of the road. I'm dating myself, get out my map, you know, kind of look where I'm going, trying to figure out where I'm at, and then, you know, look where I've been to kind of confirm where I'm at in the business cycle, right? Lagging indicators would be like corporate profits. Remember, those are profits that happened three years, uh, three months ago. You know, I, I have a friend and she, you know, divorced her husband who was a Salesforce exec and she ended up with a, a big block of sales, Salesforce stock. And she said, well, what do you think? And I said, well, why don't we wait? I mean, I, I don't see any reason for you to do anything right now until we see what's going on. Why don't we wait till the next quarter to see what the profits are or what the results have been? I said, I'm no longer a practicing uh, broker, but I got to tell you something. I wouldn't give up my sales force. I mean, I need my database. I need, you know, I'm committed to that thing. So who knows And they might do pretty well. Anyways, we looked at their quarter. We've been checking their quarters and, you know, things look good. So, but that's what's happened in Salesforce previous three months, right? Now when here we mean corporate profits in general, you know, for the whole, the whole universe, basically. The business cycle is very testable. You know, they might scramble this and ask you to put it in the proper chronological sequence. You know, that's one thing they love to do on the test. You know, as we expand, the economy expands, we would expect there to be more demand and uh, maybe supply can become constricted and we would expect perhaps inflation. You know, the test question here, very testable, is to know that two consecutive quarters of declining GDP. Got my... Uh... What color should we use? Let's use uh, green. We haven't used green in a while. And so the test question here is this, that's a testable. You know, I like what Will Rogers said. Will Rogers said a um, recession is when your neighbor's out of work and a depression is when you're out of work. You know, they, uh, a lot of economists when we're asked if the pandemic gonna be as bad as the great depression. And they said, well, we don't think under any circumstances we're going to have six calendar quarters of declining GDP. So no, but that definition is testable. Again, nobody expects you to be an economist. We do expect you to embarrass the firm at a cocktail party. I, I pulled a question here, again, from the SIE uh, FINRA practice exam. Uh, it says a decline in gross, dose dose <laughs> gross domestic product must last for at least how many quarters to be considered a recession? As we said, that is very much a test question. Two quarters, right? Now, if I were gonna write this question, I'd probably also give you a, a choice of six quarters for the depression being one of the choices, but I would definitely know that. Well, based on the business cycle, as we mentioned, a lot of people use that to make investment decisions. And so we have cyclical industries that track the business cycle. You know, the products and services consumers can delay purchasing. You know, uh, planes, you don't order a new plane unless you're feeling pretty good. You know, during the financial crisis of 2008, you know, I was talking to this billionaire, we were having lunch. I was joking. Uh, my presence at the lunch brings down the net worth of the net uh, table dramatically. Anyways, his name is David. And he said, uh, he said, did you hear about my latest acquisition? I said, no, I haven't, you know, I thought he was going to tell me about it. I thought he was going to be talking about his new G5 he was getting at the time. And anyways, it was something else pretty cool. But anyways, I said, well, what's going on with your airplane? He goes, well, Dean, uh, you know, I'm not quite sure I should take delivery of the plane. I can delay purchasing that. And, you know, I can certainly fly around a little more in my G4, you know, before I get a G5. And, you know, I'm not sure what's going to, I said, well, you know, listen, David, I said, if you don't take delivery of that G5, people are going to think there's something, that, you know, in your financial situation that may be not good. I mean, you have reputational risk and delaying the purchase of that plane. And he said, well, I never thought of it that way. I said, well, if you need to help rationalize anything, you come to me. But Boeing is learning this, right? How many people, how many airlines have delayed purchasing new airplanes? They say, wow, there's no travel demand right now. You know, automobiles. You know, I'm not surprised by this. And the financial crisis is 2008, 2009. The average age of an automobile on the road was four years. Every year since it's gone up. Last figure I saw the average age of an automobile on the road is nine years. Again, proof that people can delay purchasing automobiles, right? And these businesses, when things are good, they're really, really good. But when they're bad, they're really, really bad. You know, I have a, a contractor friend 
he tells me that a Caterpillar a bulldozer a D10 is like six figures plus. You know, might he delay purchasing a new one? He's not going to buy a new one unless he's feeling really, really good. Uh, P.S. Even Caterpillar was talking about in their earnings that they're finding it difficult because people, there's an active secondary market and a lot more people are upgrading through buying a better used version of what they have rather than a new version. Uh-oh. You know, washers and dryers, not testable, but these are called durable goods. Durable goods, typically people don't get another one for three years, right? Washers, dryers, refrigerators. Uh, I just bought myself a new uh, chair, rocking chair, lazy boy thing. I've had the last one. Everybody makes fun of it. It's been around five years and it's out on the curb this morning. It's seen its last life. And I ordered a new one that showed up yesterday, but you know, I'm not going to be buying a new lazy boy, you know, $800 recliner every month. You know, it's going to be something, by the way, I could delay purchasing, right? If things are tight, I'm going to say, Hey, I mean, I don't need a new lazy boy. I'll just, you know, put some duct tape on my old one and <laughs> make it, make it work. <laughs> Defensive is testable. Defensive companies or stocks, you know, I typically, you know, do these, uh, update these slides. You know, this is take two on this lecture. You know, I think about it and I watch it and I think, can I do a little better job? And uh, I would rather stay industries types of stocks here, but, you know, a defensive stock is a corporation whose products and services test question are resilient to the business cycle. Things that you have to continue to purchase, right? Nobody wants to go back to the stone age. You might you know, cut back on usage, but you're not going to give up your power. You still need energy to go from point A to point B. Now, how much energy you're going to need, that could be dependent. In fact, we found out here during the pandemic that, you know, a lot of people don't need as much energy in terms of petroleum as they we thought they did. Uh, some people think alcohol and tobacco are counter cyclical. You know, that during a, you know, a down cycle, people drink and smoke even more. I, I got to say, I don't know about you, but I find myself you know, pouring myself a a dram of, uh, you know, whiskey a little more often at home than I used to. <laughs> Smooth going through my stogies a little more frequently than I used to. I was teaching the, the class and this guy said, yeah, I didn't know, Dean, when times are tough, I need my drugs. <laughs> I said, Steve, we are not talking about recreational drugs here. We are talking about pharmaceuticals. If you're sick and I'm a doctor and I not tell you, you need a particular tr uh, drug, you're going to take it. It's not a function of competitive pricing, it's a function of what the drug does. And I said, listen, I have a, a generic version, it kind of works, it's cheap, and I have this really expensive patented version, it works all the time. If it doesn't work, you're gonna die, which one do you want? You're gonna take the patented one. You have to eat, you know, debate on where you're gonna eat, whether you're gonna eat groceries or you're gonna eat, you know, but you gotta eat, right? Regardless of the business cycle. You know, um, I was just reading, doesn't surprise me. Kraft has said their sales have been rising through the pandemic because people are buying a lot more of their, you know, mac, or mac cheese and their frozen products. And that doesn't surprise me, doesn't surprise me. Counter cyclical. Now a term that shows up on the 65, not on the SIE, but a term that shows up uh, quite a bit, quite frequently on the 65 is this thing called negative correlation. Things that go the opposite directions, right? So precious metals, very testable. If the market drops 10,000 points today, we'd expect the price of gold to rise. That's what we mean by negative correlation. One thing goes up, the other thing goes down or vice versa, down versus up, as well as uh, mining equipment. They love that precious metals one. And then not on the SIE, they don't use this term negative correlation, but they certainly do on the uh, series 65. Well, the only two ways you're ever going to make money in an investment is income stream and or price appreciation. That's it. So I don't care if we're talking about stocks or real estate or whatever. It's income stream and or price appreciation. And if there is no income stream in the stock, the only way you can make money in that stock is through price appreciation, selling it to someone else for more than you originally paid for it. And so there are industries that are growing even as the business cycle contracts or otherwise uh, insulated from the business cycle. For example, Zoom, right? You know, uh, last year or year before, I mean, Zoom was one of the best performing stocks out there. We wouldn't expect Zoom to give us a dividend. We expect Zoom to reinvest in our business, you know, get more server capacity to deliver more, you know, conferencing and that kind of stuff, right? So that's kind of independent of the uh, business cycle. So you would buy that as an investment advisor rep in your client's portfolio for growth or SIE as, uh, you know, somebody just in the securities industry know that there's growth stocks. 
I, I put Tesla with a question mark here because you know that's a debate, right? Is Tesla part? Is it just like any other automobile manufacturer, and, and as part of the business cycle, and people can delay purchasing, or is Tesla a company that's independent? Its growth cycle is independent of the automobile industry. It's a common debate. I mean, I even myself, right? Some mornings I wake up. And I said, man, I got to buy a bunch of Tesla. And then other mornings I wake up, I said, man, I got to short a bunch of Tesla, right? So those are a couple of examples. We also have special situation stocks, a special situation, a triggering current event, like a merger or a litigation or a new product that the company has developed. Some kind of a trigger that makes this an attractive kind of a stock to get involved in. All right, well, I hope you uh, have uh, found some test issues here. As I said, uh, this is five or six questions in this lecture found on the SIE and found on the Series 65. Uh, I'll be posting things probably today. Um, you know, I, this is the second take on this. I'm not so sure I want to take down the first take because then I have to give up the view count. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I'm not sure I'm new in social media. I'm not how important the view counts are or not, but you know, well, last time I checked it, it was a pretty popular lecture, even though it's only been up a day or two. So. Uh, you know, maybe I'll decide just to keep this one in the can for now, but oh well. Uh, again, I'm supposed to get better as it's telling you to like, to share, to subscribe, uh, to, you know, put comments in the comment book, uh, comment box, and uh, and um, I'm going to try and do something. Uh, I've been trying to show a little more love to our SIEs at our, our Series 65, so, um, you know, the predominant focus of the YouTube channel is seven. But by the time I get it all built out, there'll be something for everybody. And the predominant uh, you know, uh, focus of uh, the subreddit R series seven is the series seven, but I always like to have, you know, tell people they can join us there for you know, conversations about all their tests as they matriculate, right? The idea is you're gonna take your SIE and then matriculate to your series seven and then matriculate to a 63 or 66. So, all right, so um, I'll talk to you next time. Oh, I almost forgot. I have... no, no, no.